Welcome to A Reason for Hope, your question connection with the entire Word of God. We would love for you to join in our conversation. Simply follow us on our Facebook page at Calvary Christian Fellowship of Tucson. If you have a question, email or text us at questionsforhope at gmail.com. Now here's your host, pastor, author, and Bible teacher, Scott Richards, along with his right-hand man, Sean Richards. Hey, welcome to another edition of A Reason for Hope. We're delighted that we can join you for the next hour or so to answer your questions on the Word of God. Any question you have about the Bible, anywhere from Genesis to Revelation on the table, maybe you'd like to focus in on what the Bible has to say about current issues going on in your life and circumstances, how to apply those truths in a way that leads you smack dab in the middle of God's good acceptable and perfect will for your life. Hey, bring those questions on. We would love to be able to uh, come alongside and encourage you in your walk with God. Tough questions uh, about uh, your faith in Christ may be uh, percolating in the back of your mind. You've never found a no harm, no foul, non-judgmental place to get those questions answered. We would love to be able to help you out with that as well. Uh, the events of the day, even the events of tomorrow through biblical prophecy, all over it here on A Reason for Hope. Where we go, entirely up to you. It's your questions that determine the content of each and every edition of A Reason for Hope. Uh, So uh, we're looking forward to seeing how the Lord leads. Hey, uh, joined here by my right-hand man, protege, all-around good guy, Sean Richards. Sean, if people are uh, listening to our broadcast, I'm one of our radio affiliates, as opposed to watching us on our Facebook feed, where you can uh, get your questions to us instantaneously. How can they uh, get questions to us? You can give us a phone call at one 556 1212 or email us at questionsforhope at gmail.com. And note those venues are both available and open for you on and off hours the call-in format, since uh, your full staff is what you see right in front of you, will not be able to screen the calls. You will be able to leave them at voicemail. So when you are asked, who would you like this call directed to? Yeah. Say a reason for hope, Scott Richards, anything you'd associate with us, and then just start talking. We'll be able to read your questions, text to speech. And of course, if it's uh, someone who's just trying to make a stink or even <laughs> not, not necessarily <laughs> asking a question, yeah. we'll be able to Yeah, we get some through. of those. So yeah, yeah, we'll be able to filter through. But still, uh, as long as your question is sincere on top of our social media platforms on Facebook or YouTube at a reason for hope questions for hope at gmail.com and one 556 1212 are available okay uh, well uh, with all that being said uh, would you like to open us up in a word of prayer be happy to dad thank you that we have the chance to share your word and I want to ask that it would not only be your mind but your heart that's shown and received here today give us the opportunity to not only know that it's you speaking but to take away from it just everything that you intend out of it, more of you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, starting us off, I uh, got a question at our email address. Uh, wondering, uh, after a friend used the term seventh heaven, if the Bible supports that. Are there seven heavens? Uh, no, as far as the term heaven in its plurality, some people would look to what Paul said in Second Corinthians chapter 12 as the third heaven and suggest that there are multiple levels, but this was misunderstanding his point. In that passage, he is referring to the fact that in any language, and specifically the Greek language he was speaking to, there are three terms you can use to mean heaven. You can refer to the sky or the atmosphere. You can refer to the universe or what's commonly translated the heavens. And of course, the place where God directly manifests his glory. That would be what's called the third heaven. It uh, would basically be the third term used to describe heaven, not a third realm in the heavenly places. Uh, this is unfortunately sometimes misconstrued when people say, oh yeah, like uh, Dante's Inferno, that's uh, based on the Bible, right? Not even slightly. The idea of the underworld and pagan myth is more akin to what we saw portrayed in that, not just in regarding the specific areas or realms of heaven, but also the various realms realms and circles of hell. Neither of those things are biblical. When we're told about hell, we're told about one and only one state of existence, and that is separation from God. Note that we do acknowledge that there are those who will suffer more for what they have done in this life, but the result is, as uh, plainly stated, the separation from God is what makes hell hell. Likewise, what makes heaven heaven is that Jesus is there. Whether you are in a circle or closer to him than other people is irrelevant. What makes someone in paradise is the fact that they are with Jesus, the lowest pauper to the highest saint 
in heaven has access to him in the same way. So we need to be careful when we allow uh, even ancient pop culture and media to determine or take precedent over what scripture says. When we're talking about the afterlife, it's based on one of two factors, with or without Jesus, and that's where we need to leave it. Yeah, it, it's a classic example, I think, of uh, how sometimes ideas from really anti-Christian or uh, even uh, anti-biblical frameworks can creep into uh, our understanding and uh, our vocabulary. Uh, the idea of seven heavens uh, or seven levels of heaven is a Hindu idea that there are seven worlds above our own. Islam borrows heavily from that, speaking of the same kind of things. Uh, Babylonian uh, religion spoke about seven uh, levels of heaven. And uh, there are those who would uh, wonder if perhaps that influenced some of the thinking of the Jews who were there in Babylon. Dante Alighieri in his Divine Comedy uh, talked about seven levels of heaven. I think there were nine levels of, of hell. Uh, but all of these things uh, have no biblical warrant behind them. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's another one of those examples, I think, of uh, how sometimes uh, we can co-opt ideas from culture and assume that they're biblical without examining them. You know, the idea of seventh heaven in our culture, in our day and age, it's kind of a, a euphemism for, you know, the best, or, you know, someone's just in this complete state of euphoria or bliss. bliss. It was like seven, seventh heaven, you know, seventh heaven, uh, you know, the ultimate, the extreme. But it has no uh, biblical basis in fact. You know, another example of how we borrow from culture rather than from Christianity and some of our ideas is how many people uh, believe, for instance, the phrase, God helps those who help themselves is found in the Bible, or to thine own self be true. Well, respectively, those are Ben Franklin and William Shakespeare, but neither have any biblical support. So, you know, when someone throws around an idea or a phrase like that, sometimes it can be good because uh, it can give us an opening to talk about uh, the idea of heaven and the afterlife. So uh, we can use that as a bridge builder and say, hey, you know, it's re interesting how many people, you know, get their ideas of heaven from places outside the Bible. Would you be interested in hearing uh, what Jesus had to say about that? We can take him to John 14, where Jesus said, In my Father's house there are many mansions. I go and prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am there you may be also. Wow, some great truths you can share with people just from that simple verse. All right, uh, building on that point, and especially in what gets you to heaven or not, got a question here from Will, who has someone in their life that for many years has been repeatedly presented with the gospel and still doesn't believe. Uh, unfortunately, they think this is somehow their fault and, of course, is uh, observing that they... Um, well, the lack of belief on their part is an inability to present it more effectively. But their question is, what would you suggest that they do? Continue to be available as a part of their life? What questions or arguments would be recommended? And obviously not wanting to give up, but also walking in wisdom. Uh, well, obviously, we'll remember, first of all, before anything else is shared, you aren't responsible for whether someone received the gospel yeah, or not. Sure, yeah. There are people who, for the instance with Jonah, have been given the bare bones minimum, the worst sermon ever given, and an entire city got saved because the Holy Spirit was working. But if on the other hand you could have someone who's not only more aware of God than you or I, but has had, first of all, more face-to-face -face encounters with him than any of us will this side of heaven, and he would be classified as Lucifer. The state in which you are able to or unwilling to recognize the gospel has nothing to do with whether you presented a good argument or not. It's a matter of ultimately where they stand before the Lord in their own hearts. So make sure you don't bear that responsibility. Having said all that, what are some of the good ways that we can not just be ready, but more uh, areas to look into in order to give an informed and effective presentation of the gospel, not for the results, but so that we've done our due diligence? Well, I think uh, as far as the negative is concerned, I think of what Paul said in uh, Romans chapter 14 about, therefore, uh, let us not judge one another anymore, but let us resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in a brother's way. This is speaking about, obviously, uh, debatable issues in the Christian life, but uh, we definitely don't want to be people uh, that uh, are stumbling blocks to people coming to faith in Christ. And, you know, the number one way I think you can be that kind of a stumbling block is uh, to be a hypocrite. 
uh, one that doesn't own up, say, to one's own faults or failures, or, or sometimes we think that we have to present ourselves uh, in a way where we are almost too good to be true uh, in order for people to listen to the gospel. If we have any kind of humanness in us, we beat ourselves up and say, oh my goodness, that person isn't going to come to faith in Christ because I wasn't a great Christian. Well, none of us are great Christians 24-7, maybe even just in the span of 24 hours. We all stumble and fall in a lot of different ways. But uh, just a, uh, a hint or two about this, you know, we, you're going to find that, our, that individuals are endlessly uh, forgiving of people that are real and genuine and take responsibility for their failures, not people who do cover-up games, not people who try to present themselves as better than they are. Uh, people want to know that we're real and uh, we're genuine. And I think that is one of the most important things that we can do in our walk with God. You know, but people need to see that our lives have changed. You know, we aren't going to be perfect, obviously. We should be in process. Uh, we shouldn't be the same old people we used to be. Uh, but uh, we don't uh, have to claim that we've completely arrived yet either. And, and you know, in, in order to be a witness, in order for people to see that we're different, it can start in really small ways. Uh, I think of Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14 where it says, Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and per perverse generation among whom you shine like lights in the world. Now, if you want to shine like a light in this world, do all things without complaining and disputing. That'd be a great place to start because <laughs> you're going to be very different uh, than the average person here, especially in our criticism-oriented culture. You know, we tend to have a culture that is not so much interested in uh, what went wrong uh, as much as finding out who to blame for what went wrong. And we do a lot of finger pointing. If you don't play that game, you know, uh, you don't get into the complaining and disputing uh, aspect and uh, you let the love of Jesus shine through you. People are going to go, wow, you know, you're really different. Where does that come from? And that's a great entree to sharing the gospel. And then, of course, building up from there, what biblical case or what passage should we have in mind to properly explain should the opportunity present itself to uh, explain to someone, this is how you receive Jesus. What are the key things we need to understand? Yeah, and you know, it doesn't have to be rocket science. Uh, if you've got John 3.16 under your belt, you've really got everything you need to share with somebody how they can come to know the Lord. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, uh, it, it's uh, something that, that I mention on a semi-regular basis. But before I became a Christian, I don't remember a single time uh, any Christian ever said to me once that God really loved me. And yet it was that understanding that Jesus suffered so much when he died on the cross and then understanding that he suffered because he loved me and he died for me personally to pay the price for my sins. That's what, uh, I guess, uh, unlocked the door to my heart to turn on the light, the aha moment. And so, you know, sometimes we think, oh, if I don't have 10 or 15 scriptures memorized and the answer to every uh, tough question a non-believer is going to ask, you know, I'm incapable of, of sharing my faith. Well, you got John 3.16 down. And just explain that to somebody, that God loves you. He loves people in this world. He wants to have a relationship with you. And because we don't have a relationship with God, God did something about the problem. He gave his only begotten son to die for us, to pay the price for our sins. And our role is to simply believe, put our faith and our trust in what Jesus has done for us and to make a personal decision to put our faith in Christ. And you can simply say to him at that point, would you like to make that decision right now? We can do that in a word of prayer. Would you like to pray? And uh, you'd be surprised how often uh, when you get to that point of keeping it simple and keeping it focused, uh, people are very open to the idea of praying and even receiving the Lord, much more open than we think they, they would be. 
So focus on that one. I think you'll be good. All right. Uh, here's a question from S.A. who wants to know. Uh, pastor said that trials and temptations get more challenging instead of easier the longer you walk with God. Are there any scriptures to support this? I think the one that would most often be applied in that way is unfortunately one taken a bit out of context, which is sadly the case for a lot of passages in Jeremiah. But they would often go to Jeremiah 12 and verse 5. Yeah. Um, and this, uh, of course, is a part of a greater conversation with a lot of backdrop. Uh, the prophet Jeremiah was speaking, and notice this was his calling, which is why I emphasize kind of out of context. But his calling specifically was at a very difficult time for Israel. They were on the verge of facing judgment, yep. and a judgment that was 700 years in coming. And they had basically gotten to the point where God was straight up with Jeremiah. They're not going to listen to you. In fact, most people are going to hate you because of this, but I want you to be faithful to me anyway. And this would fall in line with other prophets like Hosea and so forth. But uh, in verse 5 of chapter 12, um, God basically answers a question from Jeremiah when uh, in the first five verses he's saying, look, why are we even doing this? I can't handle this. My people, my own family even, is turning against me as a result of sharing your word. And he says, if you have run with the footmen and they have wearied you, then how can you contend with horses? And if in the land of peace in which you trusted they wearied you, then how will you do in the footplain of the Jordan? Now, he's using two illustrations here. First, in the context of running in yeah. a race, and yeah. second, of course, in an environment where you're safe as opposed to hostile. The footmen, as opposed to horses, well, if you have to race another human being, that's relatively easier than if you had to race a horse, because horses do one thing and one thing well. They run for a lot longer and a lot faster than people. Unless you're running against Usain Bolt, but that's another yeah, story. Another story. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> even noting that as well, you can't keep up 35 miles an hour. Yeah. But when we're talking about Jeremiah's conversation with God, he's asking him, why are we doing this? And God basically says, dude, you haven't seen anything yet. You're going to be chasing horses soon, and you're uh, already tired against footmen. You should be able to handle this. Likewise, you're in a place of peace right now. It's going to get scarier. You're going to be in enemy territory, the footplain to the Jordan, soon. Why are you already tired when I've called you to do something a lot more scary than this? Now, when people would then apply this to their life and say, now understand, you may think that things are tough now, but in the worst manner of exhortation possible, <laughs> you are going to be facing a lot more horrible things in the future. That, that's just what people want to hear when, say, a child died or, a, a, you know, finances are going out. Well, it's the old saw about, you know, when a, a couple is... Uh, you know, kind of complaining about not getting any sleep with a newborn around and all of that. Yeah, wait till and, they're and teenagers. Yeah, the, the old, oh, well, you've seen, I ain't seen nothing. Yeah, wait till they're, that's the worst advice you can give somebody. Yeah. It's kind of like, oh, man, just come along and say, oh, yeah, I remember that. And sleep deprivation is really tough, but this too shall pass. That's the best thing to say. But, but as opposed to what Jeremiah was talking about, this isn't applying to every Christian ever. When Jeremiah was given a specific calling, he was told right off the bat, look, you're going to have a very difficult time with this, but I'm going to be with you. And if you have that sort of calling on your life, then God be with you in that regard. But if you want a more applicable in a broad sense for every Christian life in regards to trials and temptations, as you asked, essay, I'd better recommend 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12. It says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you, as such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So basically, Paul's point is this. God's not giving you something that he can't handle. We can't handle it, as uh, uh, the poet and playwright Oscar Wilde once said, I can resist anything but temptation. Right. We are very fallible. We are very poorly and uh, I guess low stamina, low willpower creatures. But when it comes to God in us, that's what gives us the ability to escape temptation. So when we're put through a trial, it's another opportunity to trust God. Some may be more challenging than others, but we make a mistake if we think that life is like some video game where it's tailored designed to present us with more and more challenging opponents as time goes on. Some people will be experiencing trials that they barely even notice because God's brought them through them many times before, and this is just 
a part of life, but another revelation of his character, something you can be thankful for. But if on the other hand you say, you know, I haven't really gone through any trials. I guess God's cooking up a real big one for me right now. Well, you're kind of missing the point of a trial. God isn't causing these sort of things to happen in your life. These things are going to happen one way or another because we live in a fallen world. We need to recognize that God is with us and will equip us to endure these things, great or small. There's no rhyme or reason as to why these things come in which order. It's like saying, okay, God knew that your uh, child was going to die of an asthma attack in your arms, right? To reference Levi Lusco. So I'm going to allow these easy trials in your life to prepare your character because that's going to have to happen one way or another. No, both situations, the light temptations or the huge trial that he went through are both scenarios of this world just being this world. But God was with him. God got him through the small things and the big things. And also note as well, the little things don't go away. They'll come in their own time as well. But we need to be very, very careful when we adopt the mindset of saying, well, it's only going to get worse from here, so I may as well stop complaining and just buck up. That's not Christianity, that's Stoicism. But if on the other hand you're going to say, okay, whatever comes my way, big or small, I trust that Jesus will be there with me to get me through it. So Jeremiah 12, that was a very specific situation. And note there are times where, especially for men, we need to be just told flat out, hey, you're tougher than this. Or even more specifically, I'm tougher than this and I'm with you, so let's get back to it. But if on the other hand we say, what would be the best view for every Christian ever? I'd go to 1 Corinthians 10. That's regarding the fact that whatever temptation you're experiencing, big or small, God's there with you and he provides the way of escape. Or rather, he is that way of escape. Yeah, and and I think in a situation like this, I think uh, your altitude uh, your your altitude essay is determined by your attitude. Uh, we're all going to go through difficulties and troubles in this life. I think it was Chuck Swindoll once said that in a fallen world like the one we live in, uh, trouble is mandatory, but misery is optional. If we approach things with a biblical mindset, well, what do I mean by that? Uh, you know, we can take a look at difficulties and trying circumstances where we have to depend on God like we never have in the past and kind of go into the duck and cover mode and go, oh, the storm's going on. I'll just hold on to God here, but then hopefully it'll blow over. And, hey, man, I just don't want another storm or, or trial in, in my life. And, and so we're kind of in the avoidance mode of these sort of things. We don't want to have our faith tested or tried or challenged. Well, you know, I think there's, there's wisdom to that. You know, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, studying this for this weekend in Luke chapter 10, he taught us uh, to pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. In other words, we should never be coming to God going, yeah, I'm ready, bring it on, Lord, you know, okay, is that the best you got, you know, and, and, and having that kind of cocky attitude because, you know, let's face it, uh, we need to have a very healthy set of perspectives uh, about uh, just how challenging this world can be, that uh, other people's stumbles can very well be our own and uh, whatever you may be sure of, be sure of this, we're dreadfully like other people. So we shouldn't have a cocky attitude towards things. But having said that, if we take a look at the difficulties that come our way, the challenging times that come our way, uh, you know, I have found uh, that uh, taking a look at it from the perspective of, say, what I learned from uh, running track and field, you know, it, it was this, you know, at the, the beginning of uh, the track season, you'd have preconditioning where every uh, day was a very tough workout and, you know, you're stiff and sore and you kind of get got to get through that and get your conditioning up. And then you start into having what are called dual meets where you just compete, say, against another school, another team. And these are, uh, you know, important races and each one I think is significant. But the wise track and field athlete realizes that these things are all building towards the end of the season when you have, uh, you know, first there would be league finals, uh, you know, where there would be league prelims and then league finals. You'd have the preliminary matches and you wanted to be in good shape and being able to compete at such a level that you got through those prelims and then were able to compete in the finals. And if you did well in the finals, then you could graduate on where I competed into the CIF, the California Interscholastic Federation, into their prelims and and then hopefully their finals at the end of the day. But every race that you entered into was an opportunity to be able to 
hone your craft, if you will. And the easy races as well as the hard ones. Yeah, and, and some schools you'd compete against were very easy. Um, you know, I remember once uh, we were running the 400-meter uh, the, uh, hurdles, and, you know, their, you know, the school we were competing against really didn't have any great athletes, so my buddy and I decided that we were going to try to dead heat in the race. We're going to try to cross the finish line at the same time. Well, we didn't manage to pull it off, but that wasn't really what I would call a very challenging race in my career. But then the closer you got to finals, you know, you wanted to compete, you know, and, and uh, improve your game. And you, uh, you know, once you got into prelims, you know, you were facing the best people from all the other teams. So those are more challenging races. And once you got to the final, it was the best of the best. And if you got to CIF, then obviously that was the best of the best of the best. So, you know, the level of challenge would go up. Now, imagine going into all of that as a track and field athlete and going, no, I just kind of want to race against these goof-off races because I'm really kind of scared of, of, of trials coming up, you know. Well, no, you're there because you, you want to go through that. And, and I think it's the wanna that makes all the difference in the world. You know, James chapter 1 and verse 12 says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation or trials. For when he's been approved, he'll receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who, who love him. And so when I hear people give these messages like, oh man, you think you've got trials now, you ain't seen nothing yet. Um, you know, I, I think life kind of lays itself out like that. Uh, some of my uh, older friends will tell me, man, growing old is no fun whatsoever. It's not for cowards. And there are challenges you're going to have when you get older just because your body is starting to fall apart and all that stuff that you've never experienced before. And, and I kind of get that. I understand that. But you know, if we take a look at trials in general and we look at them as a negative or as something that we should try to uh, avoid if at all possible, um, I think that's the wrong way to look at it. You know, it, it's like the Lord does a work in us and like when you try something, when you put something through a trial, say, you know, I work for BF Goodrich and I want to, you know, market a new tire and so I put it uh, through the paces on a, uh, a uh, test track. Well, I don't send that tire out there because I want it to fail. I put it out there and I put it under very challenging conditions because I want to see how well it's going to succeed. And so when we face challenging conditions in our lives, if we go into this by saying, okay, this ain't easy, this isn't fun, but here is a great opportunity for me to learn how to trust God. And I realize that God is going to bless me uh, someday with a reward if, if I stay faithful. You know, James said you're blessed if you're going through that because you're going to get the crown of life. And we also need to realize that God doesn't allow these trials into our lives to defeat us, but rather to complete us. I love what uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10 says, But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you've suffered a while perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So sometimes when we're going through those, those difficult times, those hard times, the times where the going is really, really tough, you know, we can find ourselves, if we're not careful, taking that negative point of view, going, oh my goodness, this trial is so hard. And I heard this pastor saying, this, there's nothing. And, you know, I don't know. I'm gonna... No, don't worry about your next trial. Yeah, you know, you know, it's like worrying about where you're going to be uh, five years from now. You don't know if we're going to be here five years now. Jesus could come back for us all within five years. I sure hope that that's the case. That would be awesome. Uh, but uh, I don't even know if I've got another day. I just need to learn to walk hand in hand with the Lord right where I am right now. If I don't do that, I have found this in my life, and I've had to learn this the hard way, so I share it with you. If I start looking at where I'm going to be, five days from now or next week, especially if I'm going through a time of trial, I, I find myself feeling tidal waved, you know, because it, it's just all too much for me to handle. It's like telling that, uh, that uh, parent of that newborn that's not sleeping well at night, all the rigors they're going to have to go through when their kids become teenagers. They're not there yet. So just encourage them right where they are. Encourage them to be right where they are. Just say, hey, you know, there's going to come a time when they start sleeping through the night and it's going to be like paradise for you. That's something you can look forward to. And, and you know, you just, you know, you, you invest in these kids. You make sacrifices for them. Your love for them is only going to grow. And, and if you can show them, like in that set of circumstances, the positives 
that can come out of where they're at, then that really helps. And, you know, here Peter gives us uh, the, the positives, four positives that we can look forward to as we go through trials in our lives. God is going to perfect us, make us everything he created us to be. He's going to establish us. We're not going to be hit and miss Christians any longer. It's going to be consistency in our life. He's going to strengthen us. We're going to find our, that we have the resilience to be able to face the challenges of life, unlike uh, we've ever known before, and settle us. Uh, I love that because the idea of settling means to establish something in one place. And one of the great lessons I think we learn when we go through trials is, uh, boy, what Psalm 91 so eloquently says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I love that because... If I go through a trial and I just said, okay, I'm going to just settle myself here in the presence of God. I'm going to settle myself in the love of God. I'm going to settle myself in the truth of God. Uh, then the Holy Spirit is going to be able to give me the wherewithal uh, to be able to go through all of this and to see the positives in all of this and to um, even you know, say, wow, Lord, I'm really glad you allowed me to go through this. It certainly wasn't fun at the time, but I sure learned some great lessons. You know, a year ago, uh, roughly, I, I went through uh, cancer surgery and, and all the life lessons that I learned through all of that. W would I want to go through that cancer surgery again? Um, probably not, if I had my druthers. Uh, but I learned some things in the midst of all of that I couldn't have learned anywhere else. So I go, man, bless you, Lord, for taking something that a lot of people go through and it just makes them bitter, not better. Uh, but taking something like that and saying, okay, here's a golden opportunity to trust in God. You know, you do that, you know, nobody can take away your joy, even when you're going through tough times. So, you know, when, when I hear messages like that, I know pastors are probably meaning well with all of that. But, uh, oh, you ain't seen nothing yet as far as trials go. You know, oh, you know, you think this is bad? Wait till you, you know, uh, that doesn't help me. Maybe that helps some people. I don't know. It doesn't help me. Uh, I have to look at those promises in God's word that those trials are there for a reason. There's going to be an eternal reward. I can be blessed in the midst of my trials, and here's the blessings. I can be perfected, established, strengthened, and settled. So right. let's focus on that. All right. Uh, here's a question from Robert who wants to know. Now this uh, I'm going to break up into two points because I think it brings up a precaution that we need to make sure when people bring us questions. Um, his question is, I heard a pastor, and he gives his name, say a quote. Now, let me stop right there and just clarify something. When uh, people, I, I tell individuals just talking to them, answering questions and stuff, and they ask, uh, do you do this often? I say, yeah, we, we answer questions all the time. A great question they often ask is, has there ever been a question you couldn't answer? And I say, oh, absolutely. Uh, there was uh, one situation where an individual asked me about a sermon I hadn't heard from an individual who I don't follow and said, could you explain their point better to me? Well, I hadn't heard the sermon, I don't know the individual personally, and I wasn't there when he made not only his point, but every point that led up to it. And I said, I couldn't answer the question because A, I don't have all the information, B, I'm not going to be able to minister to you because I'm not that minister. That was being spoken at that time, and there may be missing some details that would lead up to it. If I, uh, you know, pull out Larry King on you and I say, Pastor Scott, I am aware of the fact that you said last week that God is not real. Would you like to comment further? Yeah. Well, first of all, even if you did say that, it might have been out of context. You may have been making an illustration. And on top of that as well, unless you have your notes in front of you, that's not going to be very helpful. If on the other hand, you say, Pastor, well, Larry King impressions aside, Pastor Scott, what uh, do you New have? New York City, hello! <laughs> no, what, what, what are you uh, <laughs> talking about in your sermon this week? Now, there was a point brought up. Could you explain that further? That would be more helpful. But uh, if you're, and this is just for anyone, and Robert, I'm not saying this to shame you. I'm just making a point because it reminded me of an issue that we often have. If you're going to ask us questions about pastors and what they've said, Make sure that you give us more information, not less. So A, we either end up condemning them for something they weren't actually saying, or B, if they Which could are, happen. Yeah, yeah, or if they uh, are being uh, brought up, you don't mention their name or their ministry specifically that we can just focus on that topic. To say A, pastor, said. Yeah, yeah but okay. uh, the yeah. individual uh, goes on, uh, Robert, asking the question, uh, said that the pastor said the quote, you are not David. 
Uh, you believe he was talking about this in reference to how pastors would use the lives of David, Esther, and so forth to uh, use their lives as a metaphor for ours. For example, Goliath would be an example of a trial. Esther would be a calling by God. You were called for such a time as this, and uh, so on and so forth. But um, his question is, is this biblical? I guess is the crux of the question. Now, Understand, like the question with Jeremiah, I was careful to note a distinction. We are not Jeremiah. You could say I was making that point. He was at a specific time in a specific place in history, and he was a specific kind of individual where God needed to just call him up on that in that way. Now, that could have application, and the reason why I wouldn't shame the pastor for making this sort of point is because, same chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11, uh, after making a point about the book of Numbers, believe it or not, he said that all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the end of the ages has come. So the author of the book of Numbers, which was Moses, was recording history that would apply to everybody in some way or fashion. Right. We're all going to have walks with God, we're all going to blow it, and we're all going to end up falling short of the glory of God. But then the author of First Corinthians, who is Paul, knowing these things, uses those things as an illustration of our own relationship with God. Verses 1 through 9 note that they basically blew it, even though they were closer to Jesus, or about as close to Jesus as we are today. Yeah. So the warning, the instruction was, hey, you are the Israelites, to use the common language. You have the opportunity to respond to that rock that followed them in the wilderness. You have the opportunity to not exactly. fall into the same temptations they did. So I wouldn't say that uh, inspired scripture, the Holy Spirit, you got that point wrong. No, that's not obviously what's happening. But if on the other hand, we're going to say, oh, so uh, be prepared because you're going to end up facing a nine foot six tall uh, Philistine champion in battle and you better uh, keep a close eye on uh, rock streams because he and his brothers may uh, be a military threat to you one day. When that we were at the Valley of Elah in Israel, uh, I, I saw a lot of rocks in the stream that I didn't see any Philistines. Yeah, they so. were wiped out by yeah. Nebuchadnezzar <laughs> 600 years yeah. before Christ. Uh, likewise for Esther, you're not going to be put in a political... Maybe, but we don't know. We may, won't be put in a political uh, scheme where uh, you're going to be wiped out systematically based on your race or political affiliation. Uh, when we're talking about those things, obviously, there is a way to take a parallel, an illustration, or an admonition too far. But uh, no, I wouldn't say that the pastor you mentioned was off base in that regard, but I'd want to know more information about his sermon and the point that led up to it in order to clarify the point fully. I won't uh, fully recommend his ministry and say, no, this was completely uh, right. But the quote that you mentioned, it was the same way I was handling Jeremiah. I think that that's completely fair. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think of uh, what uh, God says in Psalm 33. The Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men from the place of his dwelling. He looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually and considers all their deeds. If what he's saying is that, uh, boy, you're not David and God's going to work in a different way in your life than he did in the life of David. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah that, that's true, and in a sense it's not true, and that God uh, found David to be a man after his own heart because he trusted him. And so my issue in life, same issue David had in his life, is to trust in God. Am I ever going to be king of Israel? Doubt it. Uh, am I ever going to find myself running around out in the deserts beyond Ajo, Arizona, because some crazed king wants to take me out? Probably not. Uh, but uh, we'll hold our breath. But the the, the bottom line is this: um, there are timeless principles we see illustrated in the lives of the individuals who've gone before us uh, that that uh, do uh, apply to our lives in a very uh, direct manner. You know, you read that the line from First uh, Corinthians ten. Paul reiterates it in uh, Romans chapter fifteen and verse four. It says, "For whatever things were written before." were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scripture may have hope. You know, there, there's a reason why we see the stories of these individuals. Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of fame of faith, going all the way back to uh, Abel uh, and uh, running all the way onward. Uh, we can see that there were uh, lessons from lives lived in a way where they trusted in God and some were cautionary tales about people who started trusting God and uh, later in their life, not so much. Uh, you know, but we can look back on these people's lives. You know, when you play golf and you're, uh, you're on the green, you're getting ready to, to putt, uh, one of the greatest advantages you can have 
as if someone's golf ball is behind yours and about on the same line towards the hole because they got to go first, see? It's called going to school on somebody, watching how they putt, and they you can see where the, the, the uh, green is going to break in a certain direction, and you can adjust accordingly. Well, when we see the lives of these people in the Old Testament, uh, Robert, uh, we can go to school on them. Uh, we can either say, boy, that, that person was right on line with the Lord. You know, boy, I'd love to be a Daniel. I'd love to be like a Nehemiah, someone like that. Or we can uh, say, ooh, you know, here's a guy like Solomon who started out really well and then at the end of his life was thoroughly discouraged and depressed and finally figured it out when it was all said and done and he wasted years and years of his life. Uh, that to fear God and keep his commandments is the entire duty of man. Man, I can go to school on Solomon, right? I, I, I can figure out in advance how I want to live my life and not make the mistakes that he made. So uh, for people to say, well, you're not David and, and all of this, well, no. Yeah, I am not David. No, <laughs> no I'm not. In fact, I think uh, it was uh, Peter Martin who uh, earlier in the week uh, said uh, something to the effect of, uh, People will criticize David and, uh, and his faults and flaws in life, but uh, probably they've never heard from God directly like David did uh, in his life. Like five different times, God spoke to him personally and individually. And, and so, you know, for someone to say, well, I'm, I'm better than David, you know, I'm, I'm you know, more righteous than, than he is. Well, be careful because only one person's opinion about righteousness really matters when it's all said and done. That's God's. So when we compare ourselves with ourselves, we're not wise, we're told in uh, the book of Galatians. And, and so let's just make sure that we can learn from other people these examples that have gone on before us. Uh, but let's not uh, get cocky and arrogant and say that, you know, I'm more with it together or become so discouraged and say, well, I'll never be a David. Well, you can be a David if you learn to trust in God. If you learn to sing to the Lord a new song in your heart in the morning, you could be David-like, but you are made individually by God. He fashions your heart individually and considers all your works. All right. Uh, here's a question from... Sean, who wants to know, uh, what are our opinions as having the homeless stay and live at your houses or church buildings? Uh, he gives an example where they had the opportunity, but obviously it didn't end well. Um, so the question is, of course, when we see passages like, don't uh, be afraid to entertain strangers, for some of you not knowing have entertained angels, uh, practice hospitality in all things, these definitely uh, clear statements in scripture. What would be our position concerning our own fellowship in our own house in opening our doors in this capacity? And then likewise, how should we, if not, uh, apply those passages properly in our culture and context? Well, I think there's some insight into that issue. It's a great issue uh, because, again, the, the way things work economically and, and so on in our society, we're seeing more and more people uh, finding themselves in a situation of homelessness. Some of it, obviously, a lot of it comes out of uh, untreated addiction. Uh, some of it just comes from bad things happening, bad breaks, one leading to another. Uh, you know, we, we can't paint with, with a huge broad brush. Some people are out there because, believe it or not, in our experience, they like the lifestyle. We've tried everything we can to get them situated and back on their feet, and they go, no, I prefer living in the homeless camp on the Santa Cruz River to the north of Prince Road. Um, they like it. Uh, you know, I don't like it. I wouldn't see why anybody would like it, but they like it. So, you know, whether that's mental illness or not, uh, you can you, you can make the call. I think there's an interesting insight into it, though, in uh, the account of the Good Samaritan. You know, when we talk about the homeless and caring for the homeless, that usually comes up. You're familiar with the account. Uh, Jesus uh, said a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, this happened all the time. Josephus called the road between Jerusalem and Jericho uh, the Red and Bloody Way. It was an incredibly windy, switchback-oriented road uh, because you're losing about 3,000 feet of elevation between Jerusalem and Jerusalem and uh, Jericho in about 17 miles. So the hiking uh, term would be snakes for days. I exactly. So, you know, this event uh, wasn't unusual. It says, by chance, a certain priest came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. 
Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, He who showed mercy on him. Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Well, remember this whole parable is an answer to this guy's question. Uh, how, how can I, inter- in, uh, a expert in the law asked Jesus, how can I inherit eternal life? And Jesus just turned it on him and said, what's written in the law? How do you read it? He goes, well, love the Lord you know, your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and your neighbors yourself. Yeah. And he goes, wanting to justify himself, maybe feeling a little back on his heels, maybe just looking in Jesus' eyes, kind of gave it all away. Uh, he said, well, who's my neighbor? And so this whole parable is to describe who a neighbor to this man is. But it does more than that. Uh, this Samaritan, uh, you know, as we said in the message, loved this complete stranger who was Jewish, who in any other set of circumstances, because of the stuff between the Samaritans and the Jews, would have probably just as soon spit on him as tell him the time of day. You know, he makes this sacrifice. He loved him with all his heart. He showed compassion on him. He loved him with all of his soul. The soul talks about the inner uh, a- aspects of man, including decision-making. He had to weigh things out and put his life on the line to render aid to this man because sometimes they would mug people who didn't have any money and leave them there. These thieves would lie in wait, and hopefully someone would come by and try to help them, and they would have more money, and they could get them too. So he had to weigh out, okay, you know, am I going to risk my life in all this? He loved this man with his soul. He loved him with all of his strength. He picked the guy up, put him on his own animal, cared for him throughout the night. That is investing a lot of physical energy into somebody else. But he also loved him with his mind. He gave the innkeeper two denarii, that is, two days wages. This guy had some means along with him and told him to take care of him. But then he also told the innkeeper something else. He said, watch after this man and whatever more you spend, when I come back, I'll pay you. Now, that wasn't just uh, take care of whatever needs he's got, and that's usually where we leave it, but he was smart enough to realize something. These inns that are being described here were not like the holiday inns. They're more like the flea bag, no-tell, motel kind of variety sort of places. Inns were not a place you wanted to stay. A reputable individual, most cases, would be invited into the home of a person in a community rather than having to stay at an inn. Uh, and so a proprietor of a place like that, probably the mo- not the most ethical guy you'd ever want to run into. So the Samaritan couldn't stay in a Jewish place because he was a Samaritan, would stay at an inn, and he realized that this was what was going on. And so why did he give him the two denarii uh, and tell him that I'll pay him more when I get back? Because he realized what would happen if he didn't. The guy would probably say, this is too much trouble, and he's going to throw him out on the street, and the guy would probably die. Because take care of him. And when I get back, I'll pay you whatever you, you know, you're owed. He, he gave this guy financial incentive to take care of this dude. So all this to come back to uh, this question about caring about uh, the homeless and uh, your description of a lot of churches not uh, inviting homeless people into their facilities, uh, you know, uh, people not inviting mentally ill or homeless people into their homes. Okay. You know, there are some people who are just, got to just have a calling along that line. There's some churches that have a calling along that line. And what they do is they disciple people and they raise up staff who are able to meet the specific and very significant needs of people in these sets of circumstances. Uh, That is a calling from God and, you know, more power to you. I don't think everybody's got that calling. Uh, You know, when uh, you talk about uh, dealing with individuals who are homeless or mentally ill, and you bring someone like that into your house, you could very well be putting your own family in danger along that line, and you have to really consider uh, that possibility. Uh, we had a number of different homeless outreaches that we have done, and uh, you know we uh, used to provide uh, meals uh, before our midweek service, and the word got out in a homeless camp not, near, uh, not too far away that there was food available there, and some of these homeless guys first they'd show up and we'd be more than happy to provide for them but some of them started getting aggressive 
and started threatening people that were there for church and saying, you got to give me money. And, you know, and, and so we had to cut the whole thing off because we were putting our own people at risk. And not so, only that, but there was the fact that most of them just came for the meal and left, even though we explained to them, we'd like you to stay for the service. We were providing them a disservice by enabling the food, but not, of course, the spiritual nourishment. So where do you find balance in this? Well, when people ask me, you know, how should we you care for homeless people? How should you care for that person, the median? Uh, you know, just hungry, can you help me? Uh, there's, I, I think it's one of the most wonderful, godly things in the world for us to do what we can to help those who are un, uh, or less fortunate. And so what I encourage people to do is, man, keep some protein bars in your car, have a bottle of water or two extra, and when you see someone like that where they say hungry, just say, hey, do you want something to eat? Don't give them money. You might as well just go to the crack house, buy some drugs for them, and hand it to them directly and save them the trouble because that's what's going to happen in that set of circumstances. And you haven't helped somebody. You've just enabled them. So give them food, give them water. But the other thing that we encourage our people to do is we have a tremendous ministry here in Tucson called the Gospel Rescue Mission that specializes in taking people who are down and out, giving them a place to stay, giving them something to eat, and giving them the tools necessary so they can break the cycle of despair and danger that homelessness in involves and get back on their feet by introducing them to a living relationship with Jesus and teaching them life skills. Uh, one of the things I really encourage people uh, to do is to say to somebody, hey, uh, you know, there's the gospel rescue mission here. Would you like to go there? You know, they have a women's center. Uh, would you like to go there? I can, I can make arrangements for you to get there. Now, I would never do that individually just by yourself because you could again, you put yourself in a dangerous set of circumstances. But, uh, you know, again, if you can give them directions, you can give them information about that. You can say, do you really want help? These people are just absolute pros at all this. Roy Tolgren and the other individuals who are involved there just do a, a fantastic job along the line. And that to me is the difference between a handout, which is kind of selfish, really, uh, because all I'm doing that for when I just kind of give them a handout is for me not to feel guilty. Uh, and giving them a hand up, even giving them the food, even giving them the water as opposed to the money, that's a hand up. That's meeting their immediate need and not getting hardened in my heart. And, and loving them in a tangible way, not with word or in tongue, but indeed and in truth. But the most important thing is to say, hey, do you want out of this? You know, if you do, let me help you. Let me get you connected uh, with people who can help you. So, um, you know, if, uh, you know, it's interesting, uh, Sean mentions, uh, I've personally been in the situation of a homeless ministry in Tucson. It ended very badly. I'd like to get your opinions. Yeah, it can because there's all kinds of different motivations, all kinds of different uh, kinds of fish you're going to run into that fit that, that category. And some of them can be quite, quite dangerous. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we turn a blind eye. It means that we get them the help that they really need. Uh, we do that with good boundaries, uh, being wise like the Good Samaritan was, and yet compassionate. And one doesn't necessarily outweigh the other. Yeah, and note as well, we also enable those in our ministry to have these sort of homeless kids to provide toiletries and food and everything else, especially bottled water during the summer months. We want to enable people given our culture and setting, but it wouldn't be a neglection of hospitality in that we don't open our homes to people, firstly because we're trying to be proper stewards of our own household. That's obeying also a passage of Scripture. Yeah. He doesn't tend to the needs of his own household. It's denied the faith and is worse than a non-believer. But if on the other hand as well, we say, so how do we obey that command? Well, we're trying to be faithful in that setting. So make sure that you are not only smart in how you minister to people, but you're also with the kind of heart that will be a be greater benefit to them than hurt, than enabling them. And uh, we got uh, words of uh, admonition and correction uh, saying that not all people uh, are, uh, not all homeless people are the same. Yes, we did clarify that. There are people who are down and out on their luck and just need food. There are also people who are manipulative and just appreciating that lifestyle because they don't have to pay taxes on the income. And there are also individuals who are genuinely mentally ill and are self-medicating. We understand those distinctions, 
But uh, in all those sets of circumstances, the big question is, do you want to stay in that situation? Can we help you? Can we get you the resources that you really need? So uh, definitely uh, don't want to uh, paint with a broad brush in terms of uh, homelessness. I've seen some real grifters, uh, con artists who are homeless, and I've seen some individuals that are just broken. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's one of those there, but for the grace of God, go I situations. And I, I understand those distinctions, but there are distinctions there. And uh, as we mentioned from Psalm 33, God uh, deals with us individually. We need to deal with those circumstances individually. All right. And, and again, if this is a issue where you're going to get hostile about this, then uh, again, just remember, we're trying to be clear. And if something isn't, then feel free to ask questions, but uh, don't, don't let this be an issue you divide fellowship over. When we're talking to people and we're ministering to people, we're just trying to be smart about it. Yep. Um, here's a question from Chris, and I think we can finish on this one. Uh, I hear Christians say that people that want nothing to do with God are sent to hell, so they won't be with God. But the Bible says that God is everywhere, even in hell. Psalm 139, verse 8. Can you help me understand this? This is from Chris. Yeah, Chris, uh, Psalm 139, and verse 8. If I ascend to the highest heights of heaven, you are there. I make my bed in shield you are there. Now that's a reference to the grave or the depths of the earth. That was the Jewish understanding of the place of the dead, but not capital H hell. That being said... Although in Luke 16 we see it was a dual compartment situation that involved a place of comfort and a place of torment. And there is also yeah. a distinction between the lake of fire and Sheol yeah. in that place yeah. of torment. Yeah. But note, uh, you are absolutely right, Chris, in that noting that God's presence isn't absent from hell, but there is a specific aspect of God's presence they are cut off from that makes it hell. In uh, Revelation chapter 14 and verse, let me start in verse 9. Uh, the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his right hand or his forehead, he himself Self shall also drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented, not tortured. Notice that the suffering comes from within, not from without. He will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the image of the beast and who receive the mark of his name. So in this situation, the angels warning people, if you take this mark as it's being offered, you will face an eternal consequence. This separation from God is described as not only an unending one, not only an unpleasant one, but one that nonetheless is still in the presence of the Lamb and the angels, mind you. How? Well, first of all, understand it's not because the Lamb and the angels are the ones torturing them. Never is the word torture used to describe hellfire. But if on the other hand, we're using these pictures of this kind of unpleasant state, you are separated from a key aspect of a relationship with God that you're supposed to have in heaven. When we read about the second death in Revelation chapter 20, we note that a physical death is separation from your body and your consciousness. But the second death, spiritual death, is separation between you and a relationship with God. People in hell aren't exempt from all of existence because God is indeed omnipresent. But when you're in the presence of a consuming fire, as Isaiah chapter 30, uh, 7 through 38 notes, then it's going to be unpleasant for you. When people are cut off from that relationship with God, they're given exactly what they want. The problem is that, of course, is not an existence you want and one that we encourage an alternative for you. That's the gospel. All God right, bless. God bless you. You've been listening to A Reason for Hope. Thank you again for joining us as we continue our journey through God's Word, one question of the heart at a time. Until we meet again, we would love to connect with you. You can text or email your questions to questionsforhope at gmail.com. You can also find out more about our ministry at calvarychristianfellowship.com. And be sure to join us next time on A Reason for Hope. A Reason for Hope is an outreach ministry of Calvary Christian Fellowship in Tucson, Arizona.